Hello and welcome to the Alex webinar, Holdings Comparisons, Why Are They So Complicated? I'm Carrie Cassio, Chair of the Alex Continuing Education Committee. Our presenter today is Amy Kirchhoff. Amy is the Archive Service Product Manager for Portico, a position she's held since 2006. Prior to her work at Portico, Amy was Director of Technology at JSTOR and also served as a member of the Shared Software Development Group at Ithaca. Amy will provide an overdue uh, overview of tools that are available to compare your library's holdings with other organizations. If you have questions for Amy, please type them into the question box on your screen. Amy will wait till the end of her presentation to answer questions, but you can type them in at any time. If we should go over time, Amy will answer any questions that are remaining offline, and all participants will receive the answers by email. Also, please note, today's session will be recorded, and you will receive an email with a link to the recording and slides um, soon after the webinar. We don't currently have a chat function in the GoToWebinar software so that you can talk to other attendees. But if you like, you can please use the Twitter hashtag Alexce, A-L-C-T-S-C-E, to talk further about today's session online. We won't be monitoring the Twitter feed during the presentation. Okay, and now there might be a slight delay as I turn the presentation over to Amy. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you, Carrie. Um, welcome, everybody. I want to thank you for uh, joining me today. I, I like to start my presentations with a little bit of an introduction. Um, I am Amy Kirchhoff. That's, that's, that's me from a couple of years ago. Um, I am mom to these four beautiful children. More importantly, probably in this context, at any rate, I'm the Archive Service Product Manager for Portico and uh, JSTOR. I do have, I'm a librarian. I have a Master of Arts in Library Science from the University of Arizona. And I've been with the Ithaca affiliate for forever, forever. I started at JSTOR back in 1996. Um, today I am quite focused on preservation at, at Portico and also at JSTOR. I'm going to talk about holdings presentations today, or holdings comparisons, at a sort of a, a high level, talking a little bit about the logic behind them, um, some of the tips and tricks we've, we've learned over time. Uh, you, uh, you don't have to write sophisticated tools yourself. Uh, that is the tact we've taken. Maybe not sophisticated, but we've written tools ourselves. But there are some off-the-shelf tools out there that are available for folks to use. And I'm going to mention some of them at the end. I'm going to try and give us some context uh, into how those are placed and, and the complexity of holdings and, and where, we, where we get to. We sent round, um, uh, Julie kindly sent round a survey yesterday, and I was, I was completely floored um, because by 3 p.m. we already had 112 responses. And I thought you all might be interested in what your um, colleagues have to say about why they're interested in holdings comparisons. Um, the, in terms of what content was most interesting to people uh, for doing comparisons, uh, journals and books were at the top of the list. This is fortunate for me because that's where my expertise lies. Um, it is possible to do some comparisons, a little lower level, the newspapers and government documents um, and other things. Uh, a little trickier, and we'll talk about why later on. In terms of with whom institutions want to do comparisons, um, this was this. You know what what the the little survey showed was that. You know, doing a comparison with another library or doing a comparison with your, within your own library, perhaps across aggregators, different providers, uh, we're, we're sort of neck and neck um, with then other, other comparisons sort of uh, of lesser interest but still, still true. This, this feels true to me given the anecdotal conversations we've had with librarians who come to us talking about holding comparisons. Um, We've been doing, I've been doing Holdings Comparisons at Portico for about five years now. I think we did the first one in late 2007. Uh, we've run them now for over 250 unique institutions. And one of the things we've seen is 
we've always used the Holden's Comparison tool internally when our outreach folks are talking to libraries about, about Portico, because we can say things like, look, you know, 50% of your collection is preserved in Portico, and that represents 75% of the, the Portico collection. In recent years, um, the dialogue with libraries have changed, because we've been running Holden's Comparisons quite a bit more now to help librarians do collection management activities on their own content. Um, there really seems to be a, a growing sense of urgency around them and a, around the request. Um, there's clearly a growing desire for inter and intra library collaboration, uh, including the sharing of resources. We also have a lot of folks coming to us who are interested in Holden's comparisons because they're working either within their library or within a consortia on moving content off-site, even deaccessioning content. There's a, a really strong desire nowadays not to license the same content twice or three times. And a, a real strong need to sort of in-depth understand, uh, for a library to understand its own, its own collections. In the end, this sense of urgency really seems to, to devolve down to a need to recover shelf space um, and save money. And the librarians on this call, I'm quite sure, understand that these two are usually pretty interdependent. So what do I mean when I talk about holdings? Um, for five years, I have meant journals. Uh, that is now expanded um, to, mean, to mean additional, additional content types. You know, of those 250 holdings comparisons we've run, 235 are journal comparisons and 15 are, are books comparisons. Um, uh, the, the, so there's lots of different content types involved here. So there's, there's journals that have a specific set of holdings concerns, books that have holdings interests, um, and especially with the current proliferation of e-books, understanding what's in your collection and what's at the aggregators um, and the providers is, 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 is becoming increasingly important. Uh, and then, of course, there are the government documents and newspapers and other primary source um, types of materials that are, that are also holdings that um, we want, all want to eventually be able to, to compare reasonably well. Um, unfortunately, one of the things that, uh, that is a fact of holdings is that it's not the content, just the content type. There's actually um, the format of the content can matter quite a bit. And I will betray my age by admitting that I have, in fact, researched on microfilm and microfiche. Um, but in addition to, to microfilm and microfiche, the digital content that you've licensed, digital content that might be licensed and archived, digital content that's licensed and not archived, um, you know, purchase content on site, purchase digital content not on site, print content. And in truth, there is really a matrix of um, considerations when thinking about holdings, where there's, where there's content type on one side and content format on the other. For example, uh, there may very well be two libraries who are uh, jointly weeding their collections and considering what content to keep and what content to discard. And they're going to keep one title between the two of them. Uh, and in that scenario, being able to compare the microfilm newspaper collection held at one institution with the digitized newspaper collections licensed by the other is really important and not so easy um, when, you, when you get into it. So I'm going to start with journals. Um, uh, and we're going to talk about um, some of the complexities with identifying journals and comparing them. Uh, this is the area in which I think all of us probably have the most experience. Um, it's also the area that's most tractable. Uh, I have hoped that that is because we have the most experience in it, uh, rather than the nature of the content. So at the top of any comparison that Portico, or JSTOR for that matter, does, 
we have a caveat. It's like six sentences long. I've given you the first two sentences. Um, and this is our, you know, we're trying our best comment. Uh, and I think it's helpful to just sort of show that uh, journal holdings can be, can be complex. The reality is that conceptually, when we're doing holdings comparisons, what we want to compare is intellectual content to intellectual content. Um, and I actually think that someday we will have the data mining and text analysis skills to do that, to sort of bypass this, I, uh, this uh, identifier mess and just go, look, I can look at the text and, and, and the software can figure out whether or not it's the same. But we're not, we're not there now. So at the moment, whenever we're doing a comparison, uh, we have to hang our hat on identifiers and hope we can find identifiers that are nicely tied to that intellectual content. Unfortunately, um, while there are many identifiers, and, and, and they all try and get at this, they all have different purposes to them, and so they don't always succeed. Uh, for journals, ISSN is the closest thing we have to, to a unique identifier for, for the item. I want to do a really uh, a quick walkthrough looking at some ISSN bakeries. Uh, these are live examples that I pulled out of data Portico has received over the years to run for holdings comparisons. So we can see that how for one title, the information, the identifiers of information about that title are represented at three institutions, an external source, and then at the uh, library proper, uh, the publisher proper, excuse me. So. Um, if we take a look at institution number one, and, and honest to goodness, I chose these at random. <laughs> it's the same title, three institutions, really just selected at random. Um, so the first institution, they provided Portico with a spreadsheet of holdings that had three entries for this title or pair of titles, depending upon your perspective. Um, two of them look identical. Uh, and then the third looks a little bit different. One of the things we can see is that we've got this print ISSN repeated twice in two of the entries. Um, in all three entries, the EISSN is represented. Now, now those of us familiar with the ISSN rules know that this doesn't look quite right. Um, and then uh, in the third entry, we've got this new, this new print ISSN. With a little bit of research, we can figure out what's going on here. And what it is is that this, this title, Annual Review of Pharmacology, was published with that title from, um, I'm not sure when, Volume 1, and, and finished at Volume 15 in 1975. In 1976, where, when Volume 16 picked up, it became Annual Review of Pharmacology and Toxicology. Now, when it was originally published um, in you know, the early 1970s and, and the late 1970s, there was no online presence. So of course, there was no online ISSN. There were just the two distinct print ISSNs, nicely matching the ISSN rules for title changes. Um, then, presumably, sometime in the 90s, the publishers started putting this content online and just slapped the an EISSN on what it considered to be the title. Now, I think this library has row 499 and 561, these top two, which really look like duplicates. I believe they are here twice because of how the library has purchased the content. Um, my guess is that this library has the content in print and electronically, and that electronically the library has purchased the back package, which runs from volume one through 2006, and that you buy that sort of a one-time price cost, and then also subscribes to the current content, which is 2006 forward, in addition to having the print. And when they combined their OPAC and their purchasing data, that were rolled out as these three distinct uh, entries in their, in their collection list. So if we take a look at institution number two, institution number two also listed this title twice. Um, uh, and we see the print ISSN for what we now know to be the original title um, before the title change, the print ISSN for 
the current title, um, which is after 1976, and there's no mention at all of the electronic ISSM, clearly referencing the same content, however. So now, if we take a look at institution number three, I'm trying to see if we can find some consensus as to what's going on. And institution number three provided one entry. Uh, current title, current print ISSN, again, no mention of the EISSN, the 15451, or the original ISSN for, before the title change. Although this library only has one entry, I would bet good money that they are getting access to the full title just like the other two institutions. I'm, I'm highly doubtful that this institution is only getting access to the 2006 content forward. That would, that would surprise me. So in my hunt to try and find out, you know, well, how should this be represented, um, I, I went to WorldCat. And WorldCat at OCLC has a tool called XISSN. Um, and it's a, it, in the background, it's an API, and it queries their title history and ISSN history information. Uh, and you can, you can license access to it and, and you know, throw 4,000 queries at it a day. Um, you can also, they've put, dropped a nice HTML interface on top of it. So if you just want to play around one ISSN at a time, you can drop an ISSN in, and it'll tell you what WorldCat will tell you what it thinks the title history is for that, for that ISSN. So if we drop in 00664251, this is what we see. And this, this roughly matches about what we figured out. Um, there's an initial version of the content or the title. Um, I'm going too fast here, sorry. Volumes 1 through 15 to 1975. Then there's the next version, 1976 to present. Now, the XISN tool is quite adamant that the online ISSN does exist, and it is tied to the recent title. It's not, not tied to the older title. Um, so, you know, the XISSN data at WorldCat really matches none of the libraries we have seen have represented their data to us in this way. So there's one last place I, I, I want to go look at, and that was the publisher's website. Um, and what we see at the publisher is that this journal, um, it's represented as a single journal. There's no, um, there's no break. We know from the research we've just done that at 19, between 1975 and 1976, the title changed, the ISSN changed. Um, when the publisher is presenting this, however, there's no indication of that break on this page. Um, I, I checked the website in search of ISSN to see if they made any uh, sort of public statement about what was going on with the ISSN. I couldn't find anything, but I do know that the data as it comes to Portico treats this as one title. And that's, ex that's how Portico will treat it, in fact, because that's how the data comes to us. So one of the, the so, so we have reached the, reached the end of my, my walk through, through this one example ISSN. And we are presented with some problems and some choices. There are 25,000 titles at Crossref. None of us are going to go spend the three hours needed to try and research all of these and figure it out and, and, and come up with a, a set of rules and understand them all. We're, we're not going to. Um, libraries aren't going to. Portico isn't going to. The publisher isn't going to. Uh, you know, no, no one has the time for that. So we need to come up with some automated way of getting as close as we can, of getting pretty accurate, accurate enough to do what we need to do. And in, as near as I can determine, I think we have three choices. Um, if folks have other ideas about other choices, pop them out in the question bar and let's talk about them. But I think one of our choices is to just say, never mind title history, never mind all of that. I, you know, Library A wants to compare to Library B. We're just going to say an ISSN equals a title. 
Um, and that's going to get us what we want to know, which is, do we share this title? This is actually how we did the initial Portico comparison. And in terms of the details of, is this, is this title at that institution, do we share it? Is there an overlap? It was pretty accurate. Where we ran into problems at Portico is one of the things we like to provide back is a summary of what the, what the comparison showed, which is, hey, 50% of your collection is preserved, um, and that's 75% of the Portico collection. And what we found with the one ISSN equals one title methodology was that our summaries looked fantastic. Hey, 114% of your collection is covered in Portico. And this is tied to title history and duplicate ISSN and titles and titles at multiple publishers. And, and so in order to have a relatively accurate summary, we had to dig a little bit deeper. But I actually don't think you would need to dig deeper if all you're trying to do is, if you're not really interested in that summary number, if all you're trying to do is say, do we share this one title, the ISSN, one ISSN equals one title may very well be sufficient. Um, and I actually think it's a good place to start. You can always get more sophisticated later if you need to. So I think our second choice in dealing with the messiness of ISSN and journal holdings comparisons is to find a data source to use as the master title list. And I think that that data source can be anything from the official ISSN database to um, one of the libraries in the comparison saying, we're just going to use ours as a master. I don't think that there's, in terms of journals and titles and ISSN, there's no truth. I hope I don't have any from one from the ISSN organization on this call. Um, because I, I, I don't believe there's any truth. There's, there's sort of some real truth and real standard. There's just what, we're, what the two institutions interested in the comparison are going to agree to. So you can just pick a thing and say, this is the master and we're going to use it. Um, the third choice, and this is the one we've used at Portico, is, is very, um, I want to say Buddhist, but it's very, um, you know, uh, it's very centered on, look, we're going to make the data we get from you unique within the data you set. So essentially, your data is your master list, and our data is our master list. Uh, and it's all based on context, and, and so there's no need to concern ourselves with some external master list. And we do this. Um, by following the chain of ISSN. So for Portico, for institution one, which gave us these three entries, we would follow the chain of this turquoise ISSN, 1545, and we would say, that's one title. Um, and so, you know, anytime we see this ID, any of these ISSN in the Portico data, we're going to say that's match. And that's one title. That's how we're going to count it. Because that's what your data says. Whereas for institution number two, institution number two says, this is two titles. And so we would say, OK, you think this is two titles? That's fine. Um, there's no chain for us to follow there. So we wouldn't, we wouldn't um, do it. So that's, those, I think, are, are three, um, three choices for trying to, at a title level, using ISSN as a hook to compare institution to institution. Now, I know we have libraries of different sizes on this call. Um, and I will say that uh, you can actually do a lot in Excel and Access. Um, I'm, I like to say I'm technical enough to be dangerous. I'm not a programmer. Uh, I do understand holdings, which most of the librarians, I think, on this call probably do. So it is, it is it, you know, a lot of analysis can be done just in Excel and in Access. Um, however, we'll talk in about 10 slides about some other, some other possibilities as well. Many of you have probably noticed that I've not talked at all about volumes and issues. 
um, we've talked, you know, everything so far for journals has really been at the title level. How do we see if we share a title? But if we're deaccessioning, we really want to know that not only do we share a title, but we share every issue of volume 19. Uh, I want to know that before I pull it off the shelf and, and rely on your copy. And this is an area um, of significant interest for us at Portico. Uh, and an area I have anecdotally come to understand of significant interest uh, across the library community. So this is a single title, and I the the top the top box is the Portico data for this title um, as of November fifteenth or something. What we what we had in the archive for it. Uh, now the the second and and third are just I just went to the local catalogs of two local institutions and pulled up what their records were for the same title. And um, you know, as you can see, and as everyone on this call would expect, there's really nothing one can hang code on here in terms of automating off the off the bat. Somehow we're going to have to explode holding statements so that we can get comparisons going on in there. Um, there is some there is some possible help for us in this area. The Onyx folks do have a new um, a new standard Onyx PH. Preservation Holdings, Onyx for Preservation Holdings, I think, is what the PH is for. And it, it uses the Onyx Serials coverage statement, which at least gives folks a way of, once you have blown out the holding statements, of representing them in a standard way uh, for exchange and comparison. This is an area where we are going to do significant research over the coming year or two. And if there are actually folks on this call who, who have a, a really strong interest in this area and would be interested in experimenting with us a little bit um, feel free to feel free to ping me and we'll see we'll see what we can do because we're we're really interested in being able to figure out what we've got and making that information available in such a way that others can use it and that is uh, very very similar I think to what many libraries want to do for their own content figuring out what they've got and being able to represent it in such a way that other libraries can use that information um, so this is this is up and coming. I just wanted to point out, in case some of you like, you know, now go search on your um, portico on your your website. That uh, if you were to look up this title, I can give you the title: Analytical Chemistry. Actually, what you're going to see on our website, um, we were very forthright, and we've listed each issue out. And I think uh, we'll be we'll be tweaking that to collapse them so it's a little shorter. But I didn't I didn't want anyone to go looking and go, well, that's not the screenshot she gave us. So I wanted to put a bow tie on journals um, before we move on and look at books and some other items. Um, the, the biggest recommendation I have, actually, uh, is, is a new one. Uh, you should clean up your ISSN before you try and do any comparisons. And this is, this is true whether you're doing the comparison yourself or you're loading an Excel spreadsheet into some other tool to do a comparison. ISSN are particularly messy. This is the list of rules that, that I have developed over the past five years for how to clean up ISSN. Um, don't feel the need to scribble these down if you're so inclined. I think the, the presentation will be circulated. Um, but there, you know, folks put all sorts of things in with their ISSN that get in the way of an automated um, comparison. So before you, you know, so don't get too, do, too hung up in in a zero match result until you've you've done a little ISSN cleanup. Um, so in terms of um, the, the bow on journals, uh, I wanted to reiterate that you can go far with an Excel spreadsheet and an access database. One of the things about Holden's comparisons is they tend to be very iterative. None of us are going to have success the first time out. We're we're gonna we're gonna do an, some analysis. And you know we're going to get a match in 25% of our content and not 75, and scratch our heads because we know that the overlap's more like 80. So what's what's going on? And you're going to have to look at the data and then go tweak, and look at the data and go tweak. And this is true for any holdings comparison. It's just very very iterative. Um, it'll never be 100% accurate. It, it just won't. It's too messy. 
uh, we shouldn't we shouldn't try. We're going to have to figure out what percent of inaccuracy is acceptable, and um, I suspect that's going to be very subjective and a decision made on a library by library basis. So I'm going to move on to books uh, and talk a little bit about why they're difficult and ways to get around those difficulties. Um, we've done, I ran a couple of book comparisons a couple of years ago using an access database. It's only in the past three months that we've rolled out a formal book comparison tool. But it, it, you know, that does exist now for, for Portico and JSTOR, and we do have that experience under our belt. Talking about books and holdings comparisons, uh, one has to descend into Ferber. I'm not sure if I think of descent into Ferber because this, this picture always makes me think of steps or if it feels like a descent. For, for many things, for many exercises, Ferber functional requirements for bibliographic records, I do believe. Uh, is too complex. For holdings comparisons, it actually really helps. The problem, as we said, is we're trying to compare. What we really want to compare is unique intellectual content to unique intellectual content. Um, we have to use identifiers to stand in for that. And for books, all of our identifiers hang on the manifestation, which means that the ISDN which is our identifier du jour, uh, requires that the ISBN on the, the print copy or the paperback copy of a book is uh, a different ISBN than the ISBN on the hardcover copy. Same edition, same translator, and so forth. But the, the two formats get a different ISBN, which is different from the ISBN on the Kindle version, which is different from the ISBN on the Nook version. Now, I would be remiss if I didn't mention at this point that there's quite a lot of angst and discussion in the community about um, applying those ISBN rules to the electronic versions. But last I knew, the rules still stood as written, uh, even if not everybody is listening to them. So in many cases, an institution isn't going to care about the delivery format. And you're, you're going to be interested in whether, or, um, you know, just so I have this book already, you know, should I purchase it again or not? Other times you may be interested in the delivery format. For example, okay, I have two copies in print and I can buy a single-use copy online, you know, and, and the delivery format may matter. Uh, and the ISBN is just, it's fuzzier, than, it's fuzzier than the ISSN. But it's all we've got at the moment. So Anna Karenina is my favorite example um, of this. Uh, I think because just because this, the copies of, are so prolific. So I, I took a walk through WorldCat and Amazon, just pulling out records uh, for Anna Karenina. And you know, up at the top of the WorldCat hit list was this e-audio book. Um, the reader was Davina Porter, published in 1990. We can see our two ISBN. One's the ISBN 10 and one's the ISBN 13. I'm pretty sure they're equal here, although I haven't actually done the calculation. This next block comes up as a twofer because you'll note it has the same reader, Kate Locke, the same publisher, same publication year, you know, heaven help us, two different ISBN, one for the CD and one for the uh, audio file. There was a book, uh, a book copy in, in WorldCat that had no ISBN at all. Um, here's a 2004 copy, uh, translator, Richard Pevier. Um, there's its ISBN, you know, matches nothing. And then here's another delightful entry. We've got same translator, the same publication year, and two different ISBNs one for the paperback and one for the hardback. So it, it's just, they're just a messy place. Um, it's, a, it's a rough identifier to hang your, your hat on the ISBN. Into this world enters the uh, ISTC, International Standard Text Code. This is a recent ISO standard. There is now an ISTC organization that is handing out identifiers. And it was really designed to assign identifiers to the unique works, the unique records. 
So no matter what the delivery format, no matter what the publisher, a version of Anna Karenida um, that had, you know, was published in the same year, had the same translator, has the same foreword, all of that, it would have the same, there would be a work identifier associated with it. It has not had large pickup that I've seen. It's still early days. If it were to, to, to go strong, that could prove really, really helpful in this, in this world. In terms of how Portico handles this, we actually treat it just like our journals, and we follow the chain of ISBN. So if we get a uh, spreadsheet from a, a library with four entries that all share an ISBN, we're going to say, same book. Um, and just treat that as one unique title. So I'm going to put a quick bow tie on books, and we'll move on to other types. Um, with books, again, like journals, we have to clean up the ISBN before we start doing comparisons. Uh, folks stick all, stick all sorts of text at the end of the ISBN in fields. Uh, you can have multiple ISBN in in a single field. Um, you have to be sure to convert any ISBN 10 to an ISBN 13 before you start doing comparisons to make sure you're going to get a hit. It was interesting. I was bound and determined that adding in a title string to title string comparison was going to improve our ebook comparisons. And our developer gave it a go, and I was I was wrong. It didn't, it did not. Uh, noticeably improve the results of our holdings comparisons for ebooks. I still have hope that adding in additional keywords to the comparison, publisher, keywords from the title, edition numbers, if we can find them, um, will help improve the accuracy. That's an area of research for us and, and, and probably the, the community as a whole. One of the things you probably can do when doing ebook comparisons, or regular book comparisons actually, is leveraging work you've already done. One of the things we've seen in, in the handful of ebook comparisons that we've done is that a decent percentage of them have come with a column that includes a unique record identifier. That's a beautiful thing because um, that tells us that a librarian somewhere has made the decision that these five entries are the same because they all hang off the same record number. And so we can use that to help us build a list of unique titles. To the extent that um, you are rolling your own or you're, you're working with a, a Bowker tool or a different tool, um, being able to leverage uh, resources and information you've already invested into the content can be really helpful for these comparisons. One of the things to be careful of when doing book comparisons, especially e-book, well, specifically e-book comparisons, is that the print and the electronic may not map one-to-one. -one. So we have a publisher who publishes a series. Um, and it, in print, it publishes volumes. And each volume contains five or 10 individual unique texts. Um, when they sell this product online, they blow away the concept of volume entirely, and each of those unique texts is, is an item. However, and not wrongly, um, they have put that volume ISBN onto each of those unique texts. Each of those unique texts that they're calling a book, they've sent to us as a book, and they all share an ISBN because they all came from the same bound volume, which has an ISBN. Uh, so you have to, um, with, with uh, books, you, you know, this is just another scenario where it's going to take a lot of iteration to get to the point where uh, all the functions on in the data. Um, the other thing, another thing to think about when doing evil comparisons is whether or not Include books you have access to the purchase of collections. Uh, so this is something we're a little bit happy to handle in Portico, where we have we have a preservation service. Um, 
into the other section in the, in the survey yesterday. I am not endorsing any of these uh, other than the ones I've written or wrote the requirements for, which would be the top two bullets. Um, however, these other ones do exist uh, and, and may be useful to you. So the, the Keepers folks um, have a, this is based in the UK, and they have uh, built a registry of preservation they have built a registry of preservation um, agencies and the holdings of preservation agencies. And uh, down to the volume and issue level. They do offer holdings comparisons. They look a lot like the portico comparisons where they take a list um, and then we'll compare it not just to one preservation agency but to multiple preservation agencies. Uh, they actually use the second technique where they use the ISSN organization database as the master title list. The Elrich's serial analysis system, um, that's actually one I've used. It works pretty well. You can load up a list of ISSN. It's going to tell you some overlap, tell you information about the different journals. Uh, I'm pretty sure that this is the technique one, which is ISSN, one ISSN equals one title. The others are I'm less familiar with, the World Cat Collection Analysis. If you pop that into Google, though, you will get to their About page and can read about it. The CUPS Comparison Tool. Um, CUPS is an open source uh, link resolver and an open source uh, knowledge base. And if you type, again, into Google CUPS Comparison Tool, um, you'll be directed to uh, a web page where you can do some comparisons, like select here, select there, see what the overlap is between two aggregator collections. It's kind of interesting. The Bowker's Book Analysis System. Um, this is to look at books. I've not used this one. The CRL Print Archives Preservation Registry. CRL has been building information about the volumes and issues held at print repositories. They've also included information about preservation agencies in, into that service. Um, I'm not sure that they're doing holdings comparisons, but you can go consult the registry and see what the status is of specific titles. This could be a nice way of supplementing if you and another live institution are looking at moving content off-site. Uh, you can go check and see whether that content is in one of these CRL certified print repositories. And that might provide an extra layer of uh, protection to content you're considering moving off-site. Um, if you're going to roll your own, uh, there are some data sources out there you can get a hold of freely. The Hadi Trust data is available. Harvard recently made their catalog data available. And although you can't get the ISSN database for free, if you contact the ISSN org and just ask for the ISSN L data, you should be able to get that. And that's going to link the print in the online ISSN with the L ISSN, which is sort of the master ISSN that links the two. So we're going to do a really brief foray into, into other types of content and, and ways to do comparisons. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is an area where we know we have a lot of research to do, and I think the community has a lot of research as a whole to look at. Uh, it's really hard at this level to do anything at the item level because there just aren't any identifiers down there um, in the depth of, of these other types of content, say government documents and, and newspapers. However, at least at a collection level and a title level, it's possible to do overlap just based on textual analysis 
of what's going on um, with the naming of the aggregators and publishers of the collection titles. So I have an Excel spreadsheet. See, you can get a lot far, go far with Excel. I have an Excel spreadsheet which has a lot of holdings data um, from libraries who've, who've provided holdings lists to Portico. And one of the things you know we're, we're looking at is sort of putting content into buckets to think about what it is. And so I have a in, in that spreadsheet there's a column with the aggregator title. And this is just, you know, at some point a library has provided us with data that says, hey, I have this title and I have access to it through this aggregator. And so this is the, the aggregator cell for, for one entry in that. Um, and I've got this essentially pattern matching that says, look, in that cell over there, D2, um, if, there's any, if the string ProQuest shows up, the string Factiva shows up, the string Chadwick shows up, or the string Gen GenderWatch shows up, call anything, that means that that, that title we believe belongs in, is in pro, at least one ProQuest collection somewhere. Now this is only four. There's probably should be 30 more patterns on it. But this is, again, where that iteration comes in. You kind of look at the data, you tweak it, tweak the analysis. You look at the data again, you tweak the analysis. But it's this very one um, word, ProQuest, that shows up in this once, maybe twice. You know, I'm not counting at this stage. That lets us know that this is part of that collection. For, for these kind of other content types, newspapers, uh, digitized primary source, government documents, I think we are going to have to we have to start at this place of of let's just get it into big buckets associated with with different things based upon text matching, and then dig deeper to start to think about the item level, uh, and it's it's really quite possible. So we've about hit the end of 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 my time, um, and I wanted to do a final bow tie on on what we've been talking about and just. Uh, suggest again, my biggest piece of advice is expect to iterate when you're doing holdings comparisons. It's really, it's really data analysis. Um, it's, it's not as beautifully automated as I think all of us want. There's a, you automate a little bit, you look at the results, you go change it, and you automate, so you look at the results again. Um, one of the things I have found, though, is that that very process brings about a really deep understanding of the collection, um, which makes it easier to move forward and, and do additional things in the future. So I want to thank Alex for uh, sponsoring today's um, presentation. I also need to have a nod to the Wikipedia images I, I borrowed. And I am happy to take questions now, um, or comments, or you know, whatever y'all would like. Thank you so much for your attention. Thanks, Amy. Um, we're waiting for some questions to come in. I know there were some audio problems, but those seem to have cleared up for everyone. Um, so if you do have a question for Amy, please uh, put it in there. Um, I actually have a question, which is how much do you use OCLC numbers for deduplication or comparisons outside of just ISSNs? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, we don't have them, so at Portico we've not used them much. Um, we've we've looked at using them more for eBooks, uh, where where we, we we seem to have a little bit more of a handle. But for journals, it's actually not a number we've ever tracked. It's not a number our publishers provide. Uh, so for journals, we've never used it. But any any um, any additional identifier you can throw into the mix can be really helpful. Great. I think you've stunned everybody with your amazing presentation here. Um, or scared everybody away. <laughs> You did mention the ISTC, um, and that you said has not quite caught on yet. Um, are those are those things that we're finding actually in records that you're doing comparisons on yet? 
We have not seen them in records we've done comparisons on, no. Okay. And it's not something that the publisher has been uh, provided. Okay. Uh, at, at this time, we're not seeing them. Okay. Uh, we do have a question about ISSNs. What happens when you have an ISSN number that matches an ISSN subfield Y number? Is it safe to assume that this is a true match? Oh, you are, you are farther into Mark than I am. Um, but I would say, in, in my experience, Yes. Now, and I say that, I should qualify and say that I'm not exactly sure what the ISSN Y is, but we are pretty free with a, hey, if you say this ISSN is associated with that thing, we're going to believe you. And it has worked very well for us in terms of overlap matching. Uh, so I think that the errors you will get are much fewer. You'll, you'll gain more accuracy in the overlap, that the benefit is likely much greater than the, than the few instances where it might get in the way. The more, the more, the more data in the match, the better. Great. Um, have you considered prob probabilistic matching of metadata VIP records, so title, author, publisher, and date? Yeah, we would really like to go there, and that's on our list of research areas. It's um, not something that we've done a lot of research on so far, uh, you know, other than my saying to the developer, hey, throw in title. I want to see what that does for the ebook comparison. Um, but it's absolutely an area where uh, we want to go. And to the extent that we do do that research and are able to share it back with the community, we will be happy to. We have now, um, we have quite a bit of focus over the coming years. We will focus a tremendous amount on holdings and holdings research. So that's an area I would like to get in, but it's not one we have a lot of experience with yet. Okay. Um, you had shown some issue level holdings. Where are your Portico issue, issue level holdings available on your website that people can look at? Yep. If you go to the Portico website and go, one of the tabs in the middle is um, Portico content. Uh, and if you click on that and, and, and there should be like a Portico holdings sub tab to it. If you if you look at that, um, there is a, a one liner in there uh, in the body of the text up above the table which says view as an Excel file. And if you download the Excel file, um, you will get the issue by issue holdings for all of the content in the Portico archive. Um, it is also available for view in the audit interface, but that's less it's just as accurate, but it's much more dispersed. So if what you're looking for is a concise volume, volume one, issue one to 10, it's better to grab it from the Excel spreadsheet. So it's in the Portico Holdings area uh, on the info pages. You don't have to log in or anything. OK. Um, can you talk a little bit about the comparison services that JSTO and Portico actually offer, things like time frame, lead time, costs, and other considerations? Sure. Um, we will, there, there is no cost. Uh, we can do a JSTOR book, CSP, or archive collection uh, comparison. And for Portico, we do a Portico book and a Portico journal comparison. Lead time, I think we usually say one to two weeks. Um, if we have to put a rush on it, we, we can't. We certainly, we certainly can. But there is no cost. Um, I don't think there's a link to it on the JSTOR website. You can get to, you can request a comparison for Portico from the Portico website. Uh, I don't think you can from the JSTOR one. However, in either case, if you email participation at portico.org or participation at jstor.org, those folks will field the request and forward it on to the right staff member to run it. Great. Um, you had mentioned a version of Anna Karenina that had no ISBN. And uh, someone says that publication dates were given as 1912 and 1960. And ISBNs didn't exist before about 1970, and it's not a standard practice to assign them retroactively like we do with ISSNs. So do you have other suggestions for book analysis pre-ISBN era publications? Yeah, I think this ties back to the earlier question about probabilistic matching of metadata, and mm. that's how we're going to have to get at it. So that's, a, that's absolutely a research area. I think it's going to be possible, um, especially because so many of us have so much data to draw on in terms of learning, uh, for, for software to do learning. Um, but it's not something we've, it's, 
it's on our list of interests and areas to research. Um, and I think we'll have some success, but we haven't dug into it yet. Okay. Um, somebody also asked if you've heard of Sustainable Collection Services, or SCS, uh, who runs collection analysis as well. I didn't, I didn't know about them, but thank you for, thank you for sharing. Okay. Um, and we have a statement from somebody, and I'll share this because uh, not everybody would be able to see it, but there, um, Richard Entlich at Cornell has done research on matching between ISSNs and the MARC 022 subfield A as opposed to the 022 subfield Y and would be happy to share results with anybody who would like to see that. Um, and we could probably cut and paste that um, into our, the document that we send out to um, Richard's contact information if he doesn't mind. Okay, well I think that uh, questions have slowed down. I'll just give it one more chance here and then we're gonna probably wrap up because we're just about at the end of our time. All right, well, um, I want to thank you, Amy, for your presentation. It was really interesting to hear some of the caveats and tools uh, that we can use for our holdings comparisons. And um, I want to thank all of our attendees for uh, coming in today. I hope you found our session useful. Um, someone did mention at the end that they thought Sustainable Collection Services is now part of OCLC. I, I'm not so sure about that. Um, I thought that was Rick Lug and, and Ruth um, doing that project, but I'm not, I'm not positive, so don't quote me on that either. Um, you'll soon receive after the session a short online evaluation form. I really, uh, we'd appreciate it if you take a few minutes to respond to that and return the form. Those comments do help the Alexa Continuing Education Committee plan their new offerings. Uh, and I'd like to thank Wade Wyckoff and J Jackie Samples for providing technical support for today's webinar as well as Julie Reese and Vicki Krasinski in the Alex office. Our technical support experts always make it possible for us to present these webinars smoothly. Uh, information about all Alex continuing education offerings can be found on the Alex homepage under online learning. We do have two webinars coming up in Spanish in the next few weeks and our December e-forum will be a discussion of book treatment and conservation labs. I also wanted to mention that Alex is currently looking for proposals for an online symposium for the ALA midwinter meeting and an online pre-conference for the ALA annual conference. Um, we do have, we have put a call out for some of those and if you have questions you can contact me or Julie Reese in the Alex office. So I thank you all for joining us this afternoon and I hope that you'll participate in other Alex continuing education events in the future. Thank you. <laughs>